Uh, we'll just uh, kick off with respect to the next in the series of LSJ Presents. And after last week's storm took care of, obviously, our guest Richard Fitzwilliams, who will return in the new year, we're delighted to be able to welcome an award-winning uh, speaker today, somebody who's actually picked up awards for Best Editor of the, of the Year, not once, but twice. We'll find out more about that. Plus, of course, the fabulous work that he's put into the superlative book, History of Food in 100 Recipes, which we'll obviously hear about as well, including the route from a graduate from the University of Kent at Canterbury, through to obviously uh, presenter for BBC food programmes, general um, gastronomic expert and fine individual who's also the editor of the magnificent Waitrose uh, Kitchen, which is regularly produced and uh, makes the headlines regularly within the whole system. So without any further ado, can I ask you to join me in welcoming our guest this evening, William Sitwell. Thank you. Okay, so William, there we are, you're up there, and the, the food scenario presenting the launch of uh, Waitrose into Dubai. Share with us, though, a brief tracy, how did you get into the food editor industry in the first place? Well, I'm basically a journalist who ends up on a, on a food magazine. So um, I <clears throat> studied um, politics and government at university. And uh, at school, I always enjoyed writing. My family were all sort of scribblers, and so I suppose it, I don't know, it was something that I kind of enjoyed doing. And um, at university, I wrote for the student newspaper. I had a show on our It's fair to radio. say Edith Sitwell was more than just a scribbler, if we're looking at sort of literary antecedents. Of well, yeah, she was, a very, I think she was a very important poet in the last century. Mm, exactly. Um, and I, so after university, I sort of just tried to get jobs wherever I could. Not always, you know, in the media world. I mean, I was a minicab driver in London for a bit. And I managed to get a bit of work experience on sort of local radio stations like BBC Northampton. And then I got, um, what did I do? I ended up working for an MP, a guy called Bill Cash, who was the MP for Stafford, who was fighting the sort of Maastricht Treaty during the kind of dying days of the major government. And through that, I met quite a few journalists, one of whom then... Um, uh, told me there was a job going as a researcher on the Sunday Express. And so I kind of started work there and soon found myself writing news stories, features and so on. I'd lasted there for about a few years. I mean, I sort of... I did a kind of whole crazy range of stuff from writing about showbiz to kind of crazy kind of stunt sort of journalism, you know, being forced to dress up as people and go undercover and sort of, you know... Raid we fashion shoes. We don't get our students to dress up enough, I feel, William. So, so. Well, I know. It's something, you know, you have to do everything. I mean, with, you know, in journalism, you've just got to do the stories that your editor tells you to do. I mean, I was... You may have heard of a writer called Barbara Cartland. No. She was probably... She wrote... I mean, her who's who list of her novels is about the largest... It occupied about five or six pages. She wrote about 600 novels, which she used to dictate lying on a, on a couch to her long-suffering secretaries. And anyway, there was, a, um, there was a street in Tewkesbury, and the local council had proposed that they name it Dame Barbara Cotland Avenue. And um, th there were people on the council who didn't like this idea. So uh, there was this story that council refuses to name Barbara Cartland Avenue after Barbara Cartland. So anyway, I was asked to ring up Barbara Cartland and get her view and take her to Tewkesbury to, to confront the mayor and the people on the council. And of course, she sort of said, a ridiculous idea, how dare you young man slam the phone down. So my editor said, well you do it. I said, what do you mean you do it? So you dress up as Barbara Carton and go to Tewkesbury and confront the local council. So I went to a, I sort of refused, I said no I won't do that and then I, of course I did it because you know, you have to accept all assignments as a journalist. So I went to um, Angels which is a costume hire place on Shaftesbury Avenue and got decked out in a you know, looking like Barbara Carton, and went down there with a fake dog and uh, attacked the mayor. And then I had to, I mean, so I, I, you know, so my kind of career path at this Sunday Express was quite random. I mean, I, I was once made to, uh, there, was a, there was a story, uh, a couple of stupid stories I had to do. One was um, uh, Britain's most useless postman was supposed to live in Ipswich, and I was sent to Ipswich to follow this guy round as he delivered letters really badly. Okay. So anyway, I turned up, we found this postman at sort of 
seven o'clock in the morning, followed him, and I'd never seen someone deliver post more perfectly. You know, he opened gates, walked down paths, didn't skip over little hedges. He was the most impeccable postman I'd ever, ever, I'd ever seen. Not that I've watched and trailed many postmen. Um, and I rang up the news desk. I said, this guy's a good postman, you know. And they just say to you, you know, they just get, just get the fucking story, all right? Kick him, push him in a hedge, take a picture, you know. So ethics were very much at the forefront. Yeah, so, you know, I kicked him into a hedge, took some pictures and wrote a story about Britain's most useless postman. Um, I mean, so, you know, you, you have to look forward to doing stuff like that. I mean, I once had to take a woman who had been refused entry into a disco in Birmingham because they said she was too old. I had to take her out on a night out in London to all the, night, all the hot nightclubs, which I did. And then I had a... I kind of got into an argument with her husband who thought I was flirting with his wife. <laughs> and then I was on my way home at about five o'clock in the morning and the news desk, desk rang me and said, where are you? And I said, where am I? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way home. It's five o'clock in the morning. He said, no, no, you need to go and doorstep Paul Dacre, who is the editor of the Daily Mail. And Dacre had just published a story where he'd photographed Elizabeth Taylor uh, in Farm Place, which is a clinic in America for <clears throat> drug abuse. And she was photographed in a sort of in her night nightgown and you know, nighty and dressing gown. And the, the editor of the Sunday Express thought this was a bit mean. So he said, "Well, let's see what Paul Dacre looks like in his pajamas." So I was sent to Islington to Paul Dacre's house, where I knocked on the door with a photographer hiding in the bushes, so we could snap Paul Dacre in his pajamas. Except, of course, his wife answered the door, and for some reason I decided to put on an Irish accent and pretend I was a delivery guy. He said, it's Mr. Dacre there, I need his signature here, please. And, uh, of course, she thought I was a terrorist, because it was like at the height of a lot of IRA scares. So they called the police, and I uh, had to escape. And then I had to spend the rest of the day dressing up in various pyjamas, and then they mocked Paul Dacre's head onto my body. Um, so that so uh, this is very important, Alex. This is <laughs> just how you get into journalism. So basically, it was a circuitous route through Sunday Express, and I was then made redundant. I ended up I ended up on a women's magazine, sort of by mistake, where I lasted for about three or four years, and then I got the job as deputy editor on Waitrose Food Illustrated, which was in 19, 1999, and I kind of stayed there ever since. Became editor, and then. So in these post Leveson days, do you think that the press council might have frowned upon some of those antics, or have we lost something? I don't something? know, I don't know. I mean, I never hacked anyone's phone, but I remember people telling me how you could. You know, that you rang, you, if you found someone's phone number and you rang it, you had to wait till they were either on the phone or they didn't answer, because it would then go to voicemail, and if you keyed in the code, it would immediately go to their voicemail. I mean, it wasn't very difficult. You know, I mean, it, it's hard. I, 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 you know, I, I don't know why they really call it hacking. Because it's not that, it wasn't that difficult. And of course, you know, people were hacking and then they changed the law. So suddenly what, was, what, would, what had been established legal practice then became illegal. But um, I don't think that Leveson would have complained about me dressing up as Barbara Carland any more than, but, I, but certainly not more than I complained about doing it. Have we lost something in terms of that, that kind of, in a sense, guerrilla journalism? Or, or does it still occur? I mean, you know, in your role now as editor, is there any sort of task which you sort of say, no, we need to saw on that, you need to dress up as a lobster, for instance? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you dress up as a lobster, you, you know, you get a different sort of uh, angle on the story, you know? Um, I don't know, I find that if I ever send someone to, on a story and they complain about it and say it was too difficult, I know that it wasn't as difficult as dressing up as Barbara Carton or have to in, having to impersonate people and... Um, you know, I once had to infiltrate a top secret fashion shoot that was happening in some big stately home uh, near Luton. And um, uh, we kind of hid in the bushes and, you know, had to find various ways of getting onto the, onto the set. And we were actually, we turned up, we, we joined a queue of load of extras and they sort of, they gave us cameras to pretend we were photographers in the shoot. <coughs> so we just swapped them for our cameras and we took a whole picture of the, you know, we. We, we blew this secret fashion shoot. But would Leveson have a problem with that? I don't know, really. Um, no, no animals would hurt or emotions. <laughs> There's a few angry people in the fashion world. Do, do you look back sort of with nostalgia on those days? Or, or is it a whole new world with respect to Waitrose 
kitchen or something. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it was good fun. It was very exciting. I mean, when I, my first day, I remember when I joined the Sunday Express, at four o'clock, everyone piled into the bar, and there was a bar in the building. It was called Poppins. And the idea was that the people who owned the newspaper thought it was much better to contain people by having a bar in the building than it stopped all the journalists from going getting pissed in the pubs. And um, then Because that has completely gone in the current sort of state. Yeah, of there is far happen. less alcoholism in journalism. But fortunately, there is still quite a lot of drinking at lunchtime in food journalism. So if you want to go into journalism because you want to drink at lunchtime, <laughs> then go into food journalism because you have to write about food and drink, you have to eat in restaurants. So therefore, you have to experience these places, so therefore, you have to drink. So uh, if that's your main goal, <laughs> then uh, you know, keep on going. Waitrose obviously has got lots of connotations of a sophisticated company, one of the sort of slightly up, upper market, up, up market brand, etc. As you've worked with the magazine, as, as both uh, working under editors and as editor, is, is it something you've tried to shape consciously? What sort of editorial input have you, have you put to the magazine that kind of would say, yeah, that's, that works? Well, I've, I've been on the magazine since, since 1999, when the magazine, which was called Food Illustrated, became Waitrose Food Illustrated, because we launched this title as a newsstand food title at the end of the 90s, um, at a time when there were no other beautiful food magazines. It was sort of the first one. And there wasn't that much food in supplements and so on. And food photography wasn't very good and so on. So Food Illustrator was a newsstand title then did a, did a business deal with Waitrose to become their customer magazine. And we relaunched it again about four years ago as Waitrose Kitchen, which is a much more commercial vehicle. So the direction of the magazine has changed. I mean, it's become a much more accessible title. There's far more recipes in it now. I no longer kind of commission poetry and to match portraits of you know, the English landscape, um, which I sort of things I used to get away with. We are less controversial. You know, I spent quite a lot of time trying to get, you know, chefs to slag off other chefs because it always makes good news. And um, we are more of a sort of you know, we are more about Waitrose these days, so it reflects the commercial and business aims of Waitrose. Um, but with still, you know, integrity as a, as a piece of journalism. Yeah, I mean, in terms of that integrity, because there is a, a line which say, how can you actually maintain that journalistic integrity if, obviously, the main uh, source of income is actually Waitrose itself? I mean, it's almost back to the original days of where you know, people would actually sell their newspapers and sell the queues that were working with yeah. the, the newspapers as well. Well, you know, what I, well, you know, I'm in a business that we call content marketing, and it's an area of of uh, an area of great interest for journalists because we were talking about this on, the, on, your, on your community radio earlier. You know, one of the big problems today is how do you fund journalism? There's so much free content out there. How do you, how do you pay for it? And if people are expecting free journalism, then it's quite hard to get people to pay to get behind you know, firewalls. And I think that Murdoch's experiment with the Times, while it's been very bold, you know, their subscribers are still relatively low. And the problem is that how, long, how much longer can The Guardian keep producing a massive website without much income? And actually, one of the areas where journalism can thrive is content marketing because you've got a big brands prepared to invest in photography, design, journalism, and brands who are therefore prepared to pay. I mean, when I started in this form of journalism in 1999, you know, people were a bit dismissive of what was called contract publishing, and we now call content marketing. And we call it content marketing because it's not just publishing, because we're producing content for brands, and that can be pushed out through an app, you know, digital, print. You know, we produce newspapers for some clients. You know, we produce film for others. You know, so it covers the whole gamut of, of content. So, um, you know, it's our, our challenge to bring... You know, our challenge is, A, to do a job, a marketing job for a brand, but also to do it in a way that has integrity. So there's great photography and great you know, journalism. So I think you can marry the two. So does it cross over into that whole grey field of public relations and journalism and that sort of marketing? Well, it does. Well? I, mean, I mean, it does. But, I mean, PRs and journalists have collaborated for years anyway. And uh, PR, good PRs are very useful for journalists. And you often find that people going to PR now have had successful journalist careers. You know, f you know there's, there's plenty of examples. Stuart Higgins, ex-son, is now in PR. 
Phil Hall used to open the News of the World, now as a PR company. And the reason these guys are in PR is because, you know, they've been at the, the hard end of newspapers. They're no journalists. They know how newspapers work. And so brands will hire them because they reckon they'll know how to get their, their uh, stories into newspapers. We first met when you were promoting, obviously, the book, the book, History of Food and 100 Recipes. Why the shift into what is really a, a very sophisticated, research-driven piece of, of, of writing, really? It's not, it's not tabloid journalism by any stretch of imagination. But it's something which kind of has a, a quality that you know, it's, it is the product, as you said yourself, lots of, lots of hours of research and lots of development. Why, why, why did you choose to, to do the project? Well, I was asked to write it. So, um, um, I mean, in the, in the book, in the, in, the, in the first chapter, in the, the preface, I do talk about the inspiration for the book. I mean, I, I came home from Sotheby's, the auction house in London, with an armful of early 19th century food books, cookbooks. And I was going through these books, and I suddenly thought, have I just wasted a whole lot of money? You know, have I bought a load of really dry, dull... Um, early 19th century non-fiction and actually as I started to read these books I realised that there was a lot of a massive amount of character lots of controversy, lots of opinion and there was a guy called William Kitchener who wrote a wonderful book called The Cook's Oracle in about 1812 in which he lambasted every food writer who'd existed before him and he said that you know modern cookbooks don't work the instructions are too vague and he said that I'm going to do something that that never happened before, I'm going to produce a cookbook that works. He said that modern cookbooks of his age, early 19th century, were of no use in cooking than reading Robinson Crusoe could enable a sailor, sailor to get a safe passage from England to the Indies. And I thought this was quite interesting, so I started looking back, and I found lots of other cookbooks where people were attacking their contemporaries and saying that cookbooks don't work, recipes don't work. I mean, the first ever cookbook in the English language published in 1500, called This Book of Cokery, that actually is a complete rip-off of another book called Book of Cokery, which was produced 40 <laughs> years before, except the C was replaced for a K in cokery, ingenious plagiarism. And in the beginning of that book, it says, Here beginneth a noble book, a tale of royal feasts, and ye shall find no more plainer book than this. In other words, he was saying the same thing. And now that every time a recipe book lands on my desk, the PR writes, At last... The book that works, simple recipes, tested. So, you know, it struck me that there are themes that have been going on throughout history. And so I started to delve into the past and look at how recipes were written down. And I start, the book starts in a tomb in ancient Egypt where there is the very dear, very clear depiction of bread being made in a tomb near Luxor. And, um, and then, this, and so I kind of examine how these recipes were written down. And then I discovered these things called the Babylonian tablets, which were these amazing clay tablets that for many centuries, right up until 2003, people thought were just boring chemical formulae. And then, and then someone tried a, a guy called Jean Botteri tried a new translation technique on one of the specific tablets, and they're about the size of a Kindle tablet, and he discovered it was actually a recipe for meat stew. So um, I kind of then followed a path throughout history. But um, that's one reason why I wrote the book. The other reason is actually that the publishing director of HarperCollins said, I want you to write a book called A History of Food and 100 Recipes. Will you do it? And I went, yes. So, Broadcast journalism. You're regularly sort of featured in BBC programmes. You've got a new, ser new series coming up in the new year. Um, do you feel that's another whole element of the whole strand of, of obviously getting opinions out there, sharing that we live in a multi-platform environment? Is that something which you, you sort of feel that you're gravitating more towards? Or? Well, I enjoy it. I mean, I'm asked to do it. I was filming MasterChef last week, and I'm in the next series, which starts in a couple of weeks. And I do shows like Food and Drink, and I make the odd film. I, I made a film for BBC Two, made a few films here and there and everywhere. And you don't really, at my level, you don't do telly for money. You do it because it's kind of high as high as your profile which enables you to then sell more books you know and you know if, if there's a sort of virtuous circle then it, it helps mm -hmm. I also find doing TV fun because you, it's quite good for networking so the food shows I go on you end up meeting loads of chefs and you chat with them and then the next thing is they're in your magazine or you discover something and 
So there's a sort of real, really useful um, networking reason to do these TV shows. Plus the fact they're quite fun, you know, doing MasterChef is quite entertaining and um, gives like, earn a bit of extra cash. Um, I don't think, you know, I always think it's dangerous to chase television. I think if you are, in, from a presenter point of view, I mean, if you want to be a, an assistant producer, then you just need to get in and be a runner and just start at the bottom and work your way up. Um, from a presenter's point of view, you know, I don't bash on, bang on people's doors saying, can I come and make a film for you? Desperate isn't sexy. It's not, exactly, you said it. So um, if I'm lucky enough to be asked to do stuff, then I do it. I mean, I haven't managed to turn this book into telly. Well, actually, and having said that I haven't gone around asking, I mean, I have, with my agent, sat in virtually every uh, office of every London production company trying to persuade them to turn this book into TV. So I'm actually also lying. So I am trying to get into it more. But um, the thing is, you know, television is quite risk-averse. And unless you happen to be, you know, part of the zeitgeist, it can be quite hard to get into, really. So that reality television side of things, which we're seeing a lot of now, we just come out of the Great British Bake Off, for instance. Mm. What are your views on that? Well, I mean, food makes a great subject for those shows because you can watch people succeed and watch people fail abysmally. So it makes for quite entertaining watching. Mm. You, know, when, you know, when we're on MasterChef and someone is really bombing, you can kind of feel the excitement. People go, yeah, someone's really screwing up. This will make really good telly. You know, so um, as a format, it really works because you know, obviously, every TV show, uh, you know, all these shows, they want jeopardy, and you know, the jeopardy is so obvious. Will the cake rise? Will it taste good? You got to stay until the end of the show to see if it does, and if it doesn't, the person involved um, will be humiliated. If not, they it's glory. So, food is a great subject for television because it works on so many different levels. Plus the fact is there is a, a real increase, continual increase in the interest in the subject. Mm. And, um, you know, there are, there are so many, you know, food TV shows now, but there doesn't seem to be any pausing for breath. I don't think it's going to go away. Okay. Do we have any general questions people would like to throw in at this stage? Yes, Ian. With what you just said, there's so many chefs available now. Um, I mean, do you have a favourite chef? Do I have a favourite chef? Yeah. Um, I have chefs who I like because personally they are sort of controversial and mad. Um, I mean, you know, Marco Pierre White is a kind of dangerous lunatic. Um, this isn't for broadcast, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Marco Pierre White is not a dangerous lunatic. Yeah. He's a very sane man, but he's very entertaining. I mean, people like him, what, what I find is there's a, there's a lot of really great effervescent characters in food. I mean, and that's from the consumer to the person who makes it. And, and chefs are, by their nature, you know, very often very interesting, driven, slightly crazy characters. They work insane hours. They live in a very antisocial world where when you know when they're when we're relaxing they're trying to kill themselves to cook for us. Um, so I do find drawn to these people. And um, uh, you know people like Marco are very, very entertaining and they've had an extraordinary story, you know. I mean food is one of those areas where you really can and you really have been, over the centuries, be able to come from nothing, you know, build an empire. And this was always lacking. You know, some of the great chefs of the 17th century, you know, Briat Savra, all these kind of guys, they started as very humble cooks and ended up as being amazing chefs. And it's still the same today. So you can still, so people do come up and, and to achieve the heights of, of success in the food world does take immense character. And it is a very, very tough business. So people who get through it and are successful do happen to have a great story and often interesting. So I do like I do like Marco. I, uh, in terms of chefs who I really respect and admire because their recipes are wonderful. I think Simon Hopkinson is is fantastic, um, and he writes beautifully. I think that of the kind of up and coming breed of chefs, particularly in London, Stevie Pearl is fantastic. I think his recipes. I think one of my favourite restaurants in London is a place called Dot Kitchen. 
And here's a guy who basically marries so many flavours from across the world on the plate. And he is the most exceptional cook. Um, so he's worth a journey to. There's a lot, there, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of young British chefs now using British food, being really successful, opening restaurants and so on. I think that the street food movement is really helping a lot of young chefs get, get into food because, you know, street food becomes more acceptable, more interesting. It enables people for far less infrastructure costs to set up and start producing food that they can sell to people and they can see their customers right in front of them. So I think it's a really interesting and important movement because it, it's a bit like, you know, how do you get into journalism through blogging? What circuitous route can you use? In, in, in the chefy world, you know, it was always, well, you have to go and work in a restaurant. But with street food, it doesn't cost so much to set up a store and start cooking. And, and people like me are interested in those people and we're, we're looking for talent and from those areas. And so it's certainly an area where, where I think there's lots of interesting talent. But um, there's a lot of chefs to choose from, so it's a good question. Yes. Um, what ambitions have we got with him? Have I got? Um, <laughs> to get three C's cider as the number one cider across the world? That would be good. I'm launching a brand of cider next week. It's called the Three C's, made by three chaps, me and a couple of friends. And uh, Fortnum's are stocking it from next week. So I want to become a cider magnate, obviously. That would be good fun. It's very good cider. You can find out information on 3cscider.com. But it's delicious, actually. And... Uh, if you like cider, you will like it because it's fresh, fruity, delicious, and deeply tasty. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I'm not going to retire on the back of 3C cider. Um, I, 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 I would like to write another book. I'm, I'm negotiating with some publishers at the moment over two possible books. The struggle is, you know, when you've written a history of food, you know, we used to have done it, haven't you? <laughs> it's a bit of a problem. So I, I have, so I'm having to drill down and on some subjects. There's a few stories in there actually that really interest me that I'd quite like to look at. There's an amazing story about how Lord Walton, who was the Minister for Food, actually maintained <coughs> and fed the British people during the Second World War. He was a guy, he was this establishment figure preaching the fact that you must not use the black market. But in order to actually feed Britain, he had agents out in, on the streets of Istanbul and Cairo doing dodgy deals to actually feed Britain. And it's an amazing story that I was written about, so I, I'd like to write a book about that. Um, I have a, I, I, I've got a big top secret project which I hope will come to fruition in about 12 months' time, um, <laughs> which has a, is something to do with food. Um, uh, so, I don't know really. I mean, I, what I enjoy partly is launching food magazines, and one of the ambitions I have is to open more offices internationally. So I've launched food magazines now in the UK, South Africa, and Dubai, um, and they've done well. And I'd like to do, you know, similar things in Singapore, um, Korea, um, South or North. I think we'll go to start in the South. Sorry, right. Yeah, I'm well, just worried about the fermented cabbage. Or the dogs. Because they eat a lot of kimchi there, don't they? I think eating fermented cabbage is far far. More frightening than dog. Or Morris Dancer. Or eating Morris Dancers. <laughs> <laughs> Lady at the back, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, regarding the Leveson report, what are your thoughts on the press regulatory body that they're setting up? How do you think it will impact your journalism and like, journalism as a whole? Um, do you think it's good or bad? I think the big problem is allowing politicians to have a final say about what is printed in this country. And I think it's very, very dangerous. And um, well, and I and I do think that it does threat, seriously threaten the freedom of the press. But I think the problem is that the newspapers have behaved so badly, and that, and that it's all very well when when people when other reporters say, well, there are laws in place, you know, and they can be dealt with it. And hacking was people broke the law, and people are being arrested, and so on. Um, I I think that the the royal charter is is worrying for serious journalism. I don't think it's particularly worrying for Waitrose Kitchen. Um, but I... Did you uh, Pippa Middleton? <laughs> uh, I think that... Um, 
And I think it's very interesting that you've got newspapers, you know, you've got <coughs> the Spectator, Private Eye, refusing to sign up to this. And, um, I mean, for all the jokes that are in Private Eye, it is actually one of the few organs that seriously publish investigative journalism month after month. And a lot of those stories then do find, find their way into the national press. And the big question that hasn't been answered is that if these people don't sign up, then what? And, I was, and, I, and if you listen to um, politicians, they don't know. They don't know what, what will happen. So this thing hasn't really been thought through. And I think that it's slightly... I, I do think it smacks a bit of political opportunism, how Miliband suddenly said, yes, let's accept all the Levinson proposals. It's terrible. The British press have been appalling. Mm -hmm. I think the thing is, if you have a free press, you also have to have the bad side of that, which is an abuse of that power. Because I don't think you can have one without the other. You either have a free press and you end up having people who are upset, you know, and, uh, or you don't have a free press. And I, and I think, therefore, you have to have the more uncomfortable scenario of a free press. But with, when the abuses happen, you get proper corrections. I mean, I do think it's always been a problem in this country that a newspaper can splash a story, but the clarification is so much smaller than the story itself. And I think that if victims need to get proper redress, they need to have clarifications put just as big as the stories that, you know, that followed. But I, I think that investigative journalism is so important. And if, if there isn't the money to support that, and if people feel threatened by politicians, you know, I mean, at the moment, there are more journalists that have been arrested and that are awaiting trial than in any other country, I think, in the world. So we actually that, have one coming in four nights. Well, time there you go. So that it? seemed pretty worrying and pretty repressive. And I think that if Britain is held up as a beacon of democracy, yet it has a press that is shackled, then I think that will be very damaging. Yes. Um, going off what you said earlier um, in regards to sort of processes of authors for um, recipe books and cookbooks, sort of reprising and tabooing other. Going along it in the history, did you stumble across perhaps why they did that? And then still to this day as well, why is it a habit? Uh, I mean, I think uh, thieving and stealing is obviously an innate part of human nature. People, people have always stolen recipes. I mean, epicurious.com, which is actually one of the early websites, successful websites, apart from the fact it was a food website, they said one of their big problems of all has always been people stealing their content. And people do. People have always pinched recipes from each other. And I know that in publishing recipes, you know, people only kind of tweak a measure of something to then make it their own. So I think that recipes have always been... It's act, and it's not a terribly, not necessarily a bad thing that you know, the, the recipes have perpetuated and improved by people stealing each other's ideas. I mean, maybe it's a bit like, you know, how many jokes are there? How many recipes can there seriously be? I think one of the real problems, however, for food journalism, historically, was that it was very much, publishing was, was, always, was always very much male-dominated. And you can find whole manuscripts that were lifted by male authors who then slapped their name on these books and pretended it was all of their work. Um, I mean, actually, there's a, there's a guy called Bartom Bartolomeo Scappi, who, uh, he was an Italian, he published a, a cookbook in the sort of 16th century, I think it was. And it was all, his book was always thought as being the definitive cookbook. And in his preface, he mentions a guy, a guy called Martino Rossi as being someone who'd influenced him. And no one ever knew about him. Until the 1920s, someone discovered a manuscript from this guy. And they compared the manuscript to Bartolomeo's very famous book on the art of cooking and realized that every single recipe bar about three, had been lifted from this mentor. And Rossi had never had his place in history. So men were, when men were stealing the work of women who uh, did not have the, the kudos, the reputation, and the ability to be published, and other people were just pinching other people's works. Because also the laws of copyright have always, you know, were not tied up until relatively recently. So you could steal whole tracks of work and publish it as your own. 
So, um, yeah, it's an interesting. It's a, it's, the subject of plagiarism goes all the way through my book. And then I kind of get to the end of the book and I think, hang on a second, but I've just pinched a hundred other recipes and used it as the basis for a book. So I'm, so I'm also yeah. doing it myself. It's homage, homage. Homage, yeah, exactly. It's not too dissimilar to pre 19th century literature, really. Yeah. I mean, in English literature, it was, it was exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. I mean, I nick the whole idea of the book from a book called A History of the World and 100 Objects. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've got another question. Uh, we're all studying um, journalism in one way or another, and broadcasting as well. I've not read any of your stuff, actually, but I will do. How, how do you write so it's easy for people to read? You know, because people don't, a lot of people don't read newspapers nowadays, or if they do, they might read the first paragraph and then move on. How do you maintain that interest when you Well, it's a, it's a very, very good question. Um, I have had it drilled into me over the last 20 years because I've worked for mainstream tabloids, mainstream women ma women's magazines, women's journal, and now a fairly mainstream uh, food magazine, just about accessibility. And, you know, my book is not, it's a history, but it's an accessible one. And I've, I've, I've always been, you know, it, you know, I've always therefore kept my sentences short, you know. I, I don't know, I think it's, it's, it's a tough one, because if you try and ape a particular style in order to sort of be accessible and readable, it, it won't work. Mm -hmm. For me, the, you know, the important things about journalism are, I mean, I remember when I used to write uh, uh, for gossip columns, we used to be sent off in the evening to go to parties, and the editor said to me, people, 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 quotes, 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 and that was all. And that, that is, that is what it is really. But also the ability to write colour pieces that aren't overwritten. I mean, what I find, because you know, we occasionally have to take on people who are famous in the food world but don't necessarily have a writing background. And what you find is they, they overwrite. And it feels clunky and amateur. Um, so if I was trying to explain how you need to do it at the start, I think you have to, you've got to, you know, you've got to get people's attention in the first couple of sentences. You've got to explain, you know, you've got to, you've got to set out what you're going to write about, you know, explain how you're going to do it, do it, and then say what you've just done. So it's always been the sort of same technique. I mean, I was taught geography very well by a guy at school who always taught us the technique of essay writing and just the structure, how important the structure is and how important your sort of summary is. In journalism, you know, it's always that, that first sentence, that stand first, of getting the colour in right at the start. I mean, I don't, re I don't rewrite stuff. You know, I think if you get the first sentence right, you know, if you can describe, it depends on the sort of thing you're writing, but if, you know, rather than just a sort of straight news report, but if you're writing features, you know, if you're writing interviews, that first sentence where you just describe it and also you know not putting yourself in it you know but putting yourself you know if you're if you're someone who who there is a personality that comes through your writing it's about putting yourself in it without overtly describing the fact that you're in the piece yeah. um, you see we just I just watched journalism and I was told to uh, I was it was suggested to me to read the sun for the way their format and it's brilliant you know, for, forget the headlines. Uh, you know, what you just said about short sentence. Yeah, the first sentence won't, makes you want to read on. Yeah. I mean, I do read other newspapers. But the other thing you see is the people who staff these newspapers are all the same. You know, and they go from the Sun to the Mail to the mm. Times to the Sunday Times to the Telegraph. You know, a news desk at the Telegraph looks exactly the same to the news desk at the Sun. Mm. And you probably find the guys have worked on both papers. Yeah. It's the importance of getting the story. You know, the story is the most important thing. Mm. And I always say that to, you know, would, you know, wannabe journalists who come into our offices, that how you write is not important. It's, it's getting the story that's important. Because if you have a great story, it will write itself. 
And the other thing is, getting into journalism, if you have great stories and you can bring stories to papers or magazines, that's far more important than worrying about the way you write it. Because what you need is to get your story into that paper, published and get a byline, and then hopefully get paid for it. And you may think you have a brilliant way of writing, but that is of no consequence. You've got to get the story. You've got to be able to sell your stories. Get, you know, bring, build up your contacts. Um, I mean, I remember on the Sunday Express, there were people writing for us who were terrible writers. There was a woman who used to do interviews for CNN, and so she'd interview sort of, you know, Bill Clinton, but then she'd also be able to do an interview for us that we would then dress up as an exclusive interview. Now, her, her writing was savagely awful, and it was always our job to then rewrite it. And she was the one getting bylines, and maybe she then read her pieces and saw how it was done and improved. But this, it, this, it's the story that's the most important mm. thing, and the, and the right quotes. Can't sell a paper without a story. Can't yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, it's brilliant getting a fantastic writer. Mm. They've got nothing to write about. And I think if you feel that you're reading writing, it's not very appealing. You know, I mean, the greatest novelists, the people who write less, it's like great cooks. You know, it's the confidence to do less. You know, no one moves characters out of in and out of rooms better than P.G. Woodhouse or Evelyn War. Mm. Whereas an amateur describes how the door handle was opened, they put one foot in front of the other, walked, you know, and sat down. Yeah. The greatest writers move people in and out of rooms without you even noticing. Mm. And I think that there's a lessons for journalism there as well about, you know, less is more. Mind you, it's a great, it is, when you write a book, it's quite nice to then be able to write long sentences. Yeah. Because you can, it can be, you know, to have the permission to do that. Yeah. Any other? Yes. Um, is it too much food in the media now? I mean, a kind of a cooking bubble. Cooking bubble. I don't know. I mean, fine for my where I'm sitting because we can grab it. Um, you tell me. Is there too much food? I think there's. I think the amount of food there is in proportion to the amount of people who are actually cooking and eating healthily is absurd. I think that you would, if you were a stranger to this country and you saw the plethora of food, you would imagine that we were a nation of cooks and healthy eaters, and actually nothing could be further than the truth. You know, people are eating more unhealthily than ever before. There was a survey out today saying that actually the economic difficulties have made people buy less healthy food and more cheap food, which is more calorific. So people aren't learning. Um, I think there's too much of the sort of interest in food as being a sort of seen as a, a sort of middle class hobby rather than a, a fundamental <coughs> aspect that we should embrace in all of our lives because it's about our health and our well-being and, and about entertaining friends and the pleasure you get from it. What's the situation in Norway? There's obviously you're from Norway originally in terms of the, you said that, that sort of food thing, just turning the question on itself slightly. Um, maybe not as much as in Britain, but we're getting there. Adopting a lot of the same concepts as we have in Britain, like the bake off. Yeah, but it, you know, the reason there's so much food is because we're, people are risk averse and people are saying, yeah, food works. You know, but it doesn't seem, you know, so. You know, and more, I mean, people, every TV producer is looking for the trying to find the next Nigella, the next Delia. Mm. Well, the next Pippa Middleton. So. The next Pippa Middleton. Yes. I was going to say, how, <clears throat> how did you feel about Pippa Middleton uh, last year when that was raised in the press? And I was, I found it, okay, to me it was a bit scandalous, the way it came about and the negative, and you was the only one that was sticking up. Well, I hired her and gave her a column and was the first editor to do that and she's subsequently been hired by the Telegraph and by Vanity Fair to, to write for them. I thought it would be quite fun if she joined my stable of contributors which includes very serious food writers, very accomplished chefs and you know I, I've hired, I gave Lorraine Pascal her first column, she was an ex-supermodel, I gave Sophie Dahl a column, she's an ex-model and no one complained about that. When I hired Pippa, there was this, you know, storm across the press and a, the most extraordinary amount of loathing, particularly on social media, which was really quite vile. 
And if you worried about those sort of things, you could have really worried about it. I mean, I got plenty of abuse. But, I mean, I thought that was all part of the fun, really. But, I mean, the abuse that Pippa gets... I mean, it's funny, because the Daily Mail will show a picture of her wearing an item of clothing, slag her off for wearing that item of clothing. Then you scroll down, and if you can click on that item of clothing, you can then buy it, and the Daily Mail will make money out of it. Okay? And at the bottom, there's all the comments where people kind of talk about how dreadful she is and how, how they wish they would, she would disappear and so on. So the Daily Mail is actually making money by slagging her off. It's quite clever. Um, and month after month, when we started, first started publishing, you know, they'd attack her. And they'd attack her for writing just the same sort of stuff that other people write for me. You know, when Bill Granger, who's an Australian chef, says, oh, it's spring, it's getting warm, let's eat our fresco, and here's a really nice salad recipe, you know, no one gets offended. It's just part of the cause in part of food journalism. When Pippa writes it, it's pathetic and trite and pointless and just an example of how stupid she is. You know, so there is an unbalanced approach to it. Um, and uh, she gets the sharp end of a lot of people's um, bitchy thoughts. I think it's calmed down a bit now. I've always said to her, if the quality of the work is good and the recipe is good, you don't have to worry about it. You know, there's room in this world for all sorts. And, um, uh, okay, I wouldn't have hired her unless she was who she was, but I hired her because of who she was, and I felt that in the mix of all the people I hire, that that was fair enough. And also, I'm a journalist. You know, I've edited a magazine that I like to get press coverage out of. We, we got press coverage for our magazine across the world. I mean, I would argue there's no famous food magazine in the world as a result of it. But the content we have, including her, I'm happy to stand up and defend. So if, if it's made our magazine famous, then that's fine with me. And as a journalist, that's cool. I think, they, I think you know, the attacks on her have died down, though. You know, because there's, there's only so much vitriol, to, vitriol you, could, you want to read about. And actually, when people try her recipes, they discover actually the food is really great. And she works incredibly hard for, for me. She comes in test the recipes, we taste them, she writes nicely, she comes in, you know, she works a lot, of, a lot harder than some of my contributors, she does mood boards, comes in, presents her ideas, she takes it very seriously, because she realises she can get knocked down. I mean, her book, Celebrate, which got completely savaged, but sold a hell of a lot of copies, she spent most of the time making sure the recipes work, she thought that's where she'd get attacked, and of course she actually got attacked on some of the writing. Um, but um, as I say, if another food writer had put their name on that book, people wouldn't have attacked it. Because, you know, in the food world and in, in, in mainstream food journalism, we deal in the banal. You know, we talk about how nice the weather is and here's a nice recipe. And that's what sells and the people like that. But when she does it, she gets attacked, so... You mentioned mood boards. So you know, just explain what a mood, a board, mood board is. Exactly. Well, a mood board is when, you know, you produce a series of images that might sum up the idea that you have. So if she's talking about, I want to do a Mexican feast, she'll bring a load of, she'll bring a load of images that she's put together on a board that brings it all together. I mean, when we pitch to clients, we often produce mood boards, you know, or if I'm going to create a magazine, I'll get my art director with me to scour lots of other magazines and imagery from books, newspapers, magazines, and you put it on boards and it gives, the, you know, it gives you the mood. It's a mood board, it's the board shows the mood. So, mm. Yes. Do you think recently that um, food pro programming has become like overly sensualized? So, for example, Gordon Ramsay's like F words not longer about food, it's just about him psyching people off. So you think it's moving away and sort of becoming more celebrity instead of... Well, I think some life? aspects has. I mean, I think that Gordon made, has made a whole career out of swearing at people. And he does it better than anyone else. And uh, people take it seriously, and I'm sure his sort of explosions are, are as real as they can be in, in the constraints of being filmed for that particular moment. Um, he's made a career out of it. There are other people who are quieter who've also made a career out of it. Um, I mean, I happen to love watching Raymond Blanc, who is a much sort of quirkier, more amusing witty, charming guy, and I think that he lights up the telly 
for many different reasons, just as much as Gordon might for other people. I, th I personally think that that sort of confrontational food TV is a bit passe and a bit boring, and I certainly don't watch it, because I don't believe it anyway. I think it's, I don't believe, I feel it's a bit fabricated. Um, you know, and so much of television is obviously you know, storylined. You know, if you watch Made in Chelsea, I mean, which is, I think is fantastic, rubbish. But, you know, it's sort of gripping. So, you know, like Towie, but they're all scripted. I mean, who are these lunatics who will sit and have rows in private together for the television? It's kind of odd. But, I mean, there's nothing new really because, you know, people have been shooting TV shows like that and food shows for forever. So, personally, I, I, I can't watch those shows because I don't find them very instructive. And um, what about you? Do, do you enjoy them? Well, I was just thinking it's quite interesting that it's, it's maybe moved away and they've said, oh, we can make more people watch if we focus on the, as you say, the confrontational aspect. Yeah. So, it's no longer about, okay, so you could change this, this, this. It's, oh, you're fucking shit, this, that, and the other. Yeah. And how do I go with you? I mean, Raymond Blanc thinks Gordon Rams has really damaged his industry because he says there's loads of kids worried about going into the catering industry because they think they'll get shat on by a figure like Gordon Ramsay. And the best kitchens that I've been into are the ones who are actually operating in complete silence. You know, because people are just doing work and there's one voice and that's the chef, the head chef, and you shouldn't have to raise your voice. Now, of course, you know, chefs, every chef from Heston to, you know, they've all, some of them, they do erupt when things go wrong. Do you think he can do that because he has, he is actually a fantastic chef, he's got credibility. But then I think maybe the people around him have said, look, this, this thing where you told them to tell people to F off, that's a great thing, that sells. And yeah. can, you, can you enhance that for Yeah, them? absolutely. And but do you think it's like actually natural? It can't be actually natural. No, but he is like that. He can be like that. I mean, I, I, you know, the funny thing is you have to remember that he used to work with, he worked under Marco Pierre White, you know, in Wandsworth. And Marco was shitting on him. The problem is you need crap on and abuse your chef. And... No one did it better than Marco. You know, if a chef told Marco it's too hot in here, he, he, he sliced your clothes off you. you know? I mean, if Marco didn't like a cheese board, he would throw the entire contents against the wall. You know, he used to put people in the corner and make them suck their thumb with their trousers down if they misbehaved. So when you've worked in an atmosphere like that, when you then become successful, you go, I'm fucking do. <laughs> so it perpetuates. But the new, you know, there's a new breed of interesting chefs. You know, Ottolenghi doesn't behave like that. Stevie Powell doesn't behave like that. You know, okay, there's always, you get fraught moments in any tense atmosphere of intense work and long hours. But, um, yeah, I mean. Thinking of the compensation claims. It be an interesting industry. Yeah. But, you know, the, the other thing is restaurant world is the one world where people do seem to get sacked without too much sort of, you know, you can you get fired and you don't then go and start filing you know it's just the world isn't like that there you know you people you, being fired is part of the course in, in the chef world being fired and abused i think if you're not you probably worry about it but i think that you know the problem is that the, the tv perception of the restaurant as being a savage brutal place i think is put off the more sensitive character who might have actually been very very good for the food world but I, I think as it's a bit passy, I think it is changing. And certainly, you know, a lot of kitchens I've been into are not those brutal places. But, you know, you wouldn't make a TV show in a place that was just silent, would you? <laughs> Interesting concept. Yeah. Yes? Um, you mentioned that broadcast journalism was good for networking. Do you have any techniques you use to keep contacts and stuff? Well... I mean, the food world is a very social world, and we have endless launches the whole time. So I go out a lot in London, and then you meet people, and you chat to chefs, and chefs are very gossipy, and they like chatting and so on. So, I mean, but I've, I, you know, the point I was making that, we you know, when I, if I make a food show, there's always a lot of people there who you end up, you know, because a lot of filming is not filming. So when you're not filming, you're chatting. And that's when you're kind of networking. So um, I used to do a show called Great Food Live, which was a daily live food show on um, UK TV. 
And that was great because of all the chefs that were there, you know, and, I, and it was really, really productive. Um, and, you know, you do hear, you know, we all sit there and we talk about, you know, where have you been recently, where have you eaten, you know. We chat about where we've been and, you know, and um, the critics and stuff are always a lively bunch and we sort of share information. So, yeah, I make a point, I make a point of, I'm always out. I don't live in London, but I stay two nights a week, so I'm always out two nights. I mean, I sometimes, like a week like this, I've got a breakfast, lunch and a dinner, three days on a trot. So, apart from keeling over, you know, I'll be networking as well. Yes, we'll take you. Do you think about a lot of chefs are like male, and then there's a stereotype of women doing all the cooking and stuff? Why do you think that is, and like how do you think you get around that? But why is there what women domestic cooks and male chefs, yeah, professional cooks? Yeah, there's not as many famous female cooks. I mean, you've got Nigella and Delia, but well, there are actually a lot of famous female. I mean, I think some of the most influential mm -hmm. cooks in the last hundred years have been women. You know, Elizabeth, Daly, uh, Elizabeth David, for example, for example, who completely transformed, you know, the British middle class perception of food after the Second World War, post rationing, because she came from the Mediterranean where she'd been exposed to markets and lovely food, etc., etc. Um, you've got a lot of, um, you know, there are you know, famous um, American chefs, women, um, going right back to the sort of 19th century. I think. I think the problem of professional kitchens is literally that it's very hard to be a mum and be a and be in a be a chef because you know if you're you either bathe the kids and put them to bed or you prep service and I think you know it's easier for men to do that than for women and uh, and I don't really see the way, a way around that because if you if you decide to have children um, and you want to have a food career, then you'll just be accused of not looking after them because one of the key times in the kitchen is bath time. So it's very difficult for women. Um, there are those who, who achieve it and have families, but um, they are they're, they're, they're few. I mean, Helen de Rose, for example, who cooks at the Connaught in London, she actually has her, a daughter in Paris, so she sort of flits around, but there's not many people who would do that. So I think that um, the, just the culture and the way that restaurants are run makes it hard. That isn't, isn't to say, you know, there are lots of young women working in kitchens in London at the moment. You know, there's loads at the Ivy, and, these, and there's loads of guys as well. So the thing is, you know, there's lots of kids in their 20s of both sexes in, in big restaurants around the country. But I think, you know, some of them start dropping away as they get older. Uh, you must have met thousands of meals and thousands of food and, uh, from all over the place. What's your favourite food? Yeah. How about everything you must have ate? God, well, I can smell that Indian food out there and I sort of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of probably like the rest of them dash out there in a minute. I do, I do love Indian food and I do sort of slobber and salivate at the prospect of, of it. And I could very easily live on dal, non bread and rice for the rest of my life. Um, I, so I, I think that if I had to make a choice about, you know, what cuisine could I not remove from my diet, I think it would have to be Indian. Because I really, I, I, I can't live too long without having green chilies, And I quite like them in omelettes as well, for kind of fiery breakfast. But I love Italian food. I mean, at home I just, I eat pretty, you know, you know, we eat a lot of British, food. I, roast ch I, I like roast chicken, I'm pretty good. I can make quite good roast potatoes. You know, I eat quite seasonally at home, you know, so with lots of salad in the garden and so on. But yeah, Indian food, I think, if I had to plump for one. Time for one more, so... Okay, just the back, yeah. Uh, yeah, speaking of um, curries, um, just what is your opinion on, say, since you wouldn't remove it from your diet, what do you think of like, Bradford, um, considering they consider the curry capital of the UK? Well, I'm afraid I haven't eaten in Bradford, but I think I should, especially if it's the curry capital of the UK, which I thought was Birmingham, wasn't it? Well, it's, it's yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know, I think I should get a Bradford and eat my way around it. This sounds pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, ours is the most popular in Bradford. You, yours being? Yeah, the Bradford basically is like ours is the most um, popular. In, right. They actually have one in each city, I think they have one in Birmingham as well. Yeah, I mean, we're very lucky in this country. There isn't a cuisine you can't eat. Yeah. And can't eat at a budget that you people can afford. It is extraordinary. There is no other country in the world that has embraced culture in the way that we embrace global food culture. And we are very, very lucky. And if people ever think that, you know, we live in a state of disharmony, look at the food influences that permeate British society. You know, I think it's amazingly encouraging and very exciting. Final question, uh, William. For folk who are listening to you this evening and they're thinking about entering the food journalistic, food writing thing, what are you looking for? What would you be looking for in terms of somebody who actually sort of wants to send an application for Well, I think the first thing is, let's see, if you want to be a food writer, just try and, don't worry about the food thing. Try and just get work as a journalist somehow. Because knowledge is important, but understanding how to write and getting that thing about stories is far more important. Um, I think that if someone like me... You know, if I was hiring a, an editorial assistant, and actually I'm about to hire me one, what do I look on those CVs? Um, I, you know, I'm biased. I quite like to see a, de a, a level of education that's gone up to degree level, and I have arguments with some friends about that. But it's just a question of me understanding that someone is of a certain academic standard. I like to see that they genuinely have a passion for journalism, so the CV sh displays that. So that at university, they've done stuff that demonstrate the love of media, if it's doing radio, writing for student paper. Also, sh showing a, an understanding that these days, to be a journalist, you need to have a bit of entrepreneurial zeal about you, because it's hard getting work. So, you know, if you've set up a blog, if you've managed to see if you can get some ad funding to it, if you realise that being a journalist has to be a bit of a business as well, if you're going to exist as a freelance... You know, because freelance journalism is running your own business. You know, it, it's as simple as that. It's, and um, so, you know, having work experience on your CV. Okay. The other thing is, you know, the tough thing is, we in the media do like to kind of employ people who we kind of know. And so, a lot of the people who've turned up on my magazine have been people who've come in and done work experience. I mean, I created a role for a, a staff writer for a guy that I'd met when I'd lectured at his class at journalism at City University. And he'd edited a magazine, and I went and talked his class through it. He then came into work experience. I thought he was really good, really keen, really charming. You know, just mad keen, loved the subject. And I created a role for him. So it's being in the right place at the right time. You know, you can never do enough work experience and display the keenest ability to make coffee and do all the shit jobs. Because the people who, are, who smile and, you know, are the people who you remember. Well, certainly having moved from uh, your Barbara Cartland impersonations <laughs> through to the correct way to deliver posts, through to the history of Food 100 recipes, capitals of curry, etc. It's been a, a genuine tour de force. Can I ask you to join me in thanking William Sitwell. Thank you. See you next week for another exciting LSJ present. Um,